Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I can see that the counter is slowed down a little bit. So, um, and you all are very punctual. So thank you very, very much for, um, for joining us today. Um, I'm Sam Masterson. I'm the CEO for MGFA. Um, I am in my sixth month. It seems like it's been a lot longer than that at this point, but um, it's pretty cool to say that out loud. It's been six months. I also know it's been a while because I'm starting to recognize a lot of the faces um, on the calls. I try to join as many calls as I possibly can, and um, I am starting to recognize a lot of your faces. So thanks so much for being with us today. It means, it means a lot to us. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we communicate out with our community. Uh, certainly, we do some, some pretty standard forms of communication. We send out a monthly newsletter. We've really increased the way, um, the, the number, excuse me, of social posts that we make so that we try to keep our community very informed and up to date. Um, but town halls are a really special forum. There's really nothing quite like coming together and seeing each other face to face. And, and you know, this is the best we can do right now. So this is how we come together um, for a town hall. Uh, we feel that it's very important to keep our community involved and informed, educated, and up to date. And I, I really hope that you enjoy um, what you're going to hear today on this town hall. And we're going to have some really exciting updates for you. But I think more importantly than just enjoying the call, I hope that you see yourselves in these updates. Because any organization is just as strong as its support base. And I, I sincerely mean this. I've been doing this for a long time, as has our staff. And our entire staff is on the call with us today. And an organization really is only as healthy and strong as that support base. And there's a lot of different ways to support an organization. You can volunteer, you can be a donor, you can give your time, your talent. Um, and you know, there's a lot of different ways to plug in. And so I really, really appreciate all of you um, joining us today for the town hall. But more importantly than that, I really want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts for joining us every day, every single day that you support us and that you're dedicated and that you're loyal. And so thank you so very much for that. And I know that we're all at the beginning of our relationships and we're still getting to know each other. So I hope that these town halls really do build um, trust and help us to be on our way to building very long lasting uh, relationships. So with regards to today, we have five special guests with us. Actually, all five of them are board members. As we go along, I'm going to facilitate and I'm going to introduce everyone. Um, but before we get started, I just want to uh, uh, share a couple of housekeeping items that I think are important to share up front. This is a Zoom call. It's a big call. So we do mute everybody. I know you joined a waiting room before you actually were led into the meeting and now everybody's on mute. And we, we don't do that to be rude, I promise you. We do that just so that you can really hear us when we're presenting because there's a lot of people on the call and if, if people were to come off mute, we certainly would hear a lot of background noise. So that's the reason why you're all on mute. We definitely encourage you to use that chat. We will be paying attention to questions. We had asked for questions to be submitted in advance. We have all those questions. They're all gonna be answered on this call today. They actually were all medical in nature. So Dr. Gupta, who will be our first speaker, um, is going to answer all those questions um, for you guys. So that's really, really exciting. Thanks so much for submitting those in advance. Use the chat. If we don't get to all the questions, please know that when we follow up from this call, we will be sending out um, a Word document, which will have all of the questions that were submitted in advance and chat, all of them with answers, so that you will have that as part of the follow up from this call. So today you're gonna hear some updates in way of research, programs, event fundraising, and you're gonna hear from our board, board officers about our strategic plan and the future of MGFA and what really excites them about that strategic plan. So we've got some great updates for you today and some great, great conversation. So again, thanks so much for joining us and we're just gonna move right on with our first speaker today and it's Dr. Jeff Guptal. Dr. Guptal is known by so many of you and he's a big part of the MGFA family. He's with Duke University, um, but he is an MGFA board member. And he also serves as the chair of our Medical and Scientific Advisory Board. So Jeff is gonna give us an update today on research. Thank you, Sam. So welcome everyone. It's good to, good to see so many familiar faces out there. Can, all of, can you guys see my, uh, see my slides now? Okay. You can see him. Great. So I just do need to. Okay. All right. So 
Um, yeah, as, as Sam mentioned, um, a uh, myasthenia gravis specialist at Duke University. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about the research portfolio that is supported uh, by MGFA. And at the end, we'll get to some questions um, that have been uh, submitted for things that are of interest uh, to the people attending the town hall. So this uh, discussion will we'll focus on active areas of research that um, the MGFA is supporting. And that support comes through uh, the activities that uh, MGFA does for fundraising, which many of you have probably participated in, either um, directly or as volunteers, uh, and also through donations that are provided um, by um, you know, lots of different people, people that have myasthenia, people that are interested in, in philanthropy and helping out um, other, um, helping out this organization. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, a few different programs. So one is a very um, uh, long program that's been active at MGFA called their pilot grant program. Um, we'll also talk about a collaboration between the MGFA and the American Brain Foundation. And then we'll talk about a couple new efforts that the MGFA is supporting for a rare disease network funded by the National Institute of Health called MGNet. And uh, MGFA is providing some very important support um, for uh, researchers as well as um, funding uh, research uh, specifically. And then we'll get into what's, what's gonna be coming up next. So for the next, town hall or, or maybe sometime down the road, what we may be talking about uh, at that point. Um, and I will also say that there, there's a lot going on in the field of research in myasthenia right now. Uh, and we can't cover all of it in, in this particular session. And so, you know, this is something that uh, fortunately we have a lot to cover and we can, you know, uh, you know cover additional areas of interest um, like maybe clinical trials and other things um, in the future. So number one, so first we're going to talk about the pilot grant program. And so the pilot grant program is really designed to fund uh, projects at their inception and to really try to get research programs off the ground that have a lot of promise and potential for really transforming um, the future of myasthenia. And so with each of these that we'll talk about, uh, I'm going to actually try to put a face with a name so you know who these people are that are, that are doing this research. And so the, the first active project uh, we'll talk about for today is by Dr. Richman, uh, who is an investigator at UC Davis. And uh, I, at the top, I've listed the, the title of his uh, particular research grant. And so he is really, and his team are really interested in developing a very, very targeted treatment for myasthenia. And as many of you know, most of the treatments that are currently available for myasthenia that address, that are trying to address the underlying immune system overreactivity that uh, the attack on the muscle that causes the weakness, many of those treatments that we currently use uh, not only affect the bad part of the immune system that's attacking the muscle and causing the weakness, but also have impacts on other aspects of the immune system that function normally and that are really important for us. So um, we have some limitations in the treatments in that um, you know, patients that take these immune suppressing medications that are very common, uh, commonly uh, used in the disease, um, can be at risk for infections, say more so than someone who's not taking these medications. That's just one example. And in addition, because they, they have more wide ranging um, effects, they can often have other side effects that can limit their um, use in certain, certain patients. So his goal is to develop a very targeted new treatment that only attacks or addresses the part of the immune system that's involved in myasthenia. And this, his approach is based on a, a, a very promising uh, approach to treating cancer called CAR-T therapy. Some of you may have heard about this. It's been in the news quite a bit. And this has been, been developed for the treatment of certain types of cancer. 
And in this case, he and his uh, team are adapting this approach towards targeting the uh, targeting an autoimmune disease, myasthenia. And so we know that a certain immune cell called a T cell interacts with another immune cell called a B cell that produces the antibodies that cause the disease. And this is illustrated down here in the lower right. And so in myasthenia, we have a T cell that's not activate, that's not operating appropriately and tells a B cell to start producing antibodies to attack the muscle. And so in this particular approach, what they're doing is to test this, they're going to selectively try to kill the cells that are uh, involved in the immune attack in musk myasthenia gravis. And so here they, they take um, a person's T cell out and they engineer it to attack the B cells that um, are generating antibodies against the musk protein and cause weakness. At least that's the ultimate goal. And the first step of this uh, is to test this in animals. And so what they're going to do is uh, generate these engineered T cells that will attack the B cells in an animal, an experimental form of myasthenia gravis with the goal that they can make the um, myasthenia, the weakness that the animals experience better, but also if, see if they can eliminate the, the antibodies that attack, um, attack the muscle. So the importance of this particular project is uh, one, this would be one of the first demonstrations of using this approach uh, in autoimmune diseases. And it could have a very wide um, impact on other autoimmune diseases. And of course, for myasthenia, if this is successful, it could be further developed as a potential treatment that is extremely selective and doesn't uh, hopefully lead to any of the other side effects that we commonly observe with our current therapies. So that's project number one. Number two is a project by Dr. Maselli. And this project is not in the autoimmune form of myasthenia, but in the congenital uh, myasthenia. We call it congenital myasthenic syndrome. And here in this form of myasthenia, the weakness that is the hallmark of, of myasthenia gravis is caused by a genetic mutation that impairs the nerve to muscle communication and uh, causes the weakness. And so here, what they're trying to do is deliver the defective gene that is absent in certain forms of uh, this uh, congenital myasthenia uh, and to see if they can deliver the gene and repair the defect. And so here they're using a, uh, a virus actually, this virus AAV9, that this virus is known to, um, it really likes to go into ner nerve cells and is used to deliver various types of um, genes uh, in other um, diseases. Um, so Duchenne muscular dystrophy and some others, this type of approach has been used in the past to deliver um, genes selectively to nerve, to motor nerves. And so here the thought is if they can get this, uh, the defective gene, the um, if they can uh, replace the defective gene with the good gene into the motor nerve is that uh, it can produce um, the product uh, here, the choline acetyltransferase and improve the weakness. And so here we, the experiment is basically you take a mouse that doesn't have the gene, which is very weak and has severe myasthenia and then you combine this AAV9 with the, uh, the good version of the gene and inject that into the mouse, it goes into the nerve and hopefully will improve the weakness um, that is observed in the mouse and reverse the problem. So the, the real significance of this project is that if this works, it could be this same approach could be used to treat other forms of congenital myasthenia for which currently there is, there is no effective treatment other than symptomatic um, therapies with, with pyridostigmine, for instance. So that's the second project. 
The third project is, is one that I'm actually the principal investigator for. And so this one is um, looking at the immune system as well. And so here we know that I mentioned earlier that we have um, these T cells, these immune cells in the body. And we know that in myasthenia, uh, one of the cells that is acting uh, abnormally is something called a Th17 cell. And this cell is known to play a large role in inflammation, um, not just in myasthenia, but in other autoimmune um, diseases like Crohn's, Crohn's disease and some others. And so these inflammatory cells um, uh, are, are active not only in myasthenia, but have also can play a role in, in cancer. And it was observed that in cancer, these inflammatory T cells um, use energy differently um, than other types of T cells. And so the goal of our project is to see whether or not uh, that holds true in autoimmune disease like myasthenia. And so what we're doing is we've taken, uh, we have blood samples that we've been collecting from uh, for many years from patients in our clinic. And we're going to test when we uh, expand this population of Th17 cells to see how they're using energy. And if we find that they're using uh, energy differently than, than the rest of these other T cells, this may be an area that we could target for a future therapy so that we can exhaust the energy supply of these, part these particular cells that seem to be driving a lot of the inflammation in myasthenia. The next project is, that is currently ongoing is um, by Dr. Amanda Guidon, um, who is at Harvard Medical School. And so her project is, is really interesting and looks at the challenge of how we measure uh, symptoms and uh, the patient experience with myasthenia. And, and you'll see this as a common theme as we, as we move along. And how do we develop personalized management plans and treatment plans um, for patients? We have some ways to measure these things, which some of you have probably experienced in your clinic visits in terms of um, outcome measures that we will do and we you know, push and pull on your arms and legs and things like that. But she's trying to develop additional ways of, of measuring the effects of myasthenia uh, in the clinic and then also outside the clinic to better tailor our treatments and, and management plans for patients. And to do this, uh, she's going to use, oops, sorry. She, she's gonna use uh, some everyday technologies uh, and bring them to bear for myasthenia. And so one of these that I'll um, highlight specifically is assessing people's speech rec through recordings, either um, through smartphones or other devices that for instance could measure um, slurring of people's speech as, as they're talking. And that's a very difficult thing for us to, to, to measure. Um, you know, we hear, you know, we know it when we hear it and you know when you have it, um, but it, it may be helpful to um, be able to measure that in a very specific way to better um, know uh, when things are uh, particularly worrisome that uh, someone needs to get, uh, get help or contact their physician, things like that, or to predict um, what may happen in the future in terms of getting worse. So she's in the process of, um, uh, of working on this uh, project with, with her collaborators. Now we're going to shift to another collaboration that the MGFA is actively working on with the American Brain Foundation. This is also a program that has been ongoing since at least 2010. Uh, and so here, the, the goal of these particular awards is to not only fund some, fund some research, but also to develop a person and specifically to develop the next generation of researchers in myasthenia so that a lot of the, the advances that we're you know, hopefully making now and that have been made will continue to have the next generation of scientists to continue that and improve upon it um, over the coming years. 
And so uh, this project is um, by Dr. Shruti Raja, um, and uh, this is a mentored award, and I'm one of her mentors along with um, Dr. Donald Sanders at Duke. And so here, her project, in addition to getting some training and how to do uh, clinical research and uh, taking, some, taking some courses to help her become a better researcher, She's also gonna look at how uh, myasthenia is being managed from a surgical and medical perspective in, in the real world. And so in a lot of cases, um, you know, we have some data from randomized clinical trials, but as many of you know who have participated in clinical trials, it doesn't represent like everyone that's out there that with, uh, with myasthenia. These trials have very rigid criteria for who can uh, participate in them and exclude lots of people that, um, that have you know, real problems and that are managed <laughs> uh, for myasthenia. And so we need to have other ways to, to, um, to analyze data uh, and improve the way that we manage patients. And so one of her, prod, her objectives is to look at how thymectomies are being done. So thymectomy or removal of the thymus gland, which is a gland that sits in the front of the, of the heart, is known to be important uh, for certain forms of myasthenia, particularly patients that have acetylcholine receptor antibodies. And in the past, this type of surgery had been done very frequently through, um, uh, through the sternum which is through the anterior part of the chest, they opened the, that part of the chest like an open heart surgery and did, did the thymectomy that way, removed the thymus gland. Currently, people are, it, it has transitioned more uh, to doing minimally invasive surgeries where they use robots and small cameras to be able to do those approaches. But the outcomes of those surgical approaches over the short term and long term aren't very well known if you try to compare the two different approaches. So her, her, um, one of the objectives of her project is to look at how patients do immediately <clears throat> following surgery with each of those approaches. And so her data analysis is ongoing for that and she's um, going to be presenting an abstract at the Society of Thoracic Surgeons annual meeting uh, next year. The other objective that she's working on is how patients respond to um, IVIG or um, intravenous immuno immunoglobulins. In some patients, uh, they receive int intravenous immunoglobulins long term, which is a, a, a way that hasn't really been studied very well. It's been um, uh, studied more, uh, more so in, in for patients who are experiencing an, an exacerbation and using it for a short for a short term. And so for, for this objective, she's going to be looking at how IVIG is used in an ongoing study called PROMISE-MG, which is a, um, a study that is being led by Dr. Donald Sanders and Pushpa Narayamaswamy. Um, uh, Dr. Sanders is, is at Duke and Dr. Narayamaswamy is um, in Boston at Beth Israel. So some of this um, aspect of the study has been impacted by COVID-19, but we are, um, you know, pressing on as, as best we can to, to complete this research. The uh, next two um, areas I'm going to highlight are uh, for a recently awarded NIH grant for um, myasthenia gravis for a rare disease clinical research network. And there are over 20 of these networks of rare diseases that are supported by NIH. And this is the first time that one has been um, funded for myasthenia. And this network is called MGNET. And MGNET has several programs associated with it, one of which is a training program um, similar to uh, what I was just talking about with Dr. Um, Raj's program. And uh, here, um, this is the MG, MGNET Scholar Program. And so it provides mentorship um, as well as um, uh, some financial support and research costs um, uh, for the awardee who this year is also Dr. Guidon. And 
So uh, her primary mentor for this project is Dr. Chip Howard, who's at um, UNC Chapel Hill, just down the road from me. And her project is looking at the feasibility and outcomes of telemedicine for outpatient treatment of myasthenia. What's really interesting and, and ironic about this particular project is that this was submitted before COVID-19 and was approved right before it started. <laughs> so this was a, a very omniscient project that uh, Dr. Guidon had submitted and perfectly tailors into kind of where we're at in the real world of trying to manage uh, myasthenia gravis right now. And so this is a, uh, will be a really influential um, project. And, uh, you know, so some of the things that, that she's interested in looking at is, you know, just big picture wise, how do we do telemedicine most effectively for patients with myasthenia? How do we assess patients? Are we, we use certain disease activity measures, but which ones are the best for, for evaluating patients uh, by telemedicine? Uh, and do some need to, be, need to be adapted to be able to do this? And what obstacles have we, can we identify um, and address to make this an easier approach to, uh, to evaluate patients? And then, of course, like, do, you know, do we think that this is an effective way to, to, um, to monitor patients? Because, you know, eventually the COVID-19 pandemic will go away. And, you know, does telemedicine have a role in the future for how we manage uh, myasthenia gravis um, outside of the pandemic? And so I think, you know, there's a lot of people have the opinion that, yes, this could be an effective tool for, for monitoring, um, monitoring patients, saving them time. Um, you know, coming often traveling long distances to see their providers. So, uh, so this will be a very uh, interesting project as well. And uh, next is the pilot pilot grant for MGNet. And the idea of this is quite similar to the, the MGFA's own pilot program. Um, and here it's really to, to try to really stimulate an area of research that has um, very high promise. And the awardee this year was um, Dr. Carolina Barnett Tapia from University of Toronto. And her, over her career, she's been very interested in understanding um, the patient's experience with, with myasthenia. Uh, and this particular project is looking at how um, patients experience symptoms and side effects from their treatments, and then to look at how um, physicians and patients differ or maybe agree on the significance of those um, symptoms and, and side effects uh, from, from their treatments. And through doing this, you know, hopefully will understand what's really uh, what's important to patients to a better degree than that we do now so that we can you know uh, make decisions more uh, more appropriately and we think that the that this research also could have an impact on how clinical trials are, are designed in the future and how drugs are developed And so uh, to end up, I'll just uh, mention what's next. So right now the M MGFA is in their pilot research grant um, uh, funding cycle. And so there are nine grants that are currently under review. There's also a special program specifically for myasthenia um, research for, for patients with seronegative MG, patients that don't have antibodies detectable in their blood. This is very exciting because this is uh, an area uh, of research that, um, that has a lot of gaps that we need to fill in terms of understanding uh, seronegative uh, research. And th there are grants for that that are under review. And then each year the MGFA uh, supports the scientific session um, where uh, scientific uh, research is presented by a lot of different investigators um, from North America, but also across the world. And this year, this will take place virtually uh, in October, and we're always very grateful to the MGFA for their support for we can share research, the latest advances, and decide, you know, what's, what, are the, what are the next steps that we need to take uh, in, in our, our research. And the last thing to mention is that 
um, the MGFA has also been very supportive of um, consensus guidelines for the management of myasthenia. And there is a revision of this, an update that is um, uh, that should be hopefully coming out um, relatively soon. And I mentioned this because it's um, it was a small investment on the part of MGFA, but it's made a huge difference. And this is a, a very widely cited um, guidance document that's recognized uh, internationally for how we manage uh, myasthenia gravis. And this is something that um, was possible through support uh, from the MGFA. So I'm gonna um, stop there. And then I think um, you had some questions. Is that right, Sam? Yeah, some that questions, questions that were submitted in advance, Jeff. Uh -huh. um, one of the biggest questions that we've received are, um, can you share some information on the effect of COVID-19 on the MG population? Risk factors, um, any current information on rates of infection, recovery, symptoms, other than the usual ones, precautions, and treatments. Okay. Yeah, so that's a, a big topic. Um, yeah, so this is one that, that I was uh, sort of expecting <laughs> to have. This is a very common uh, topic that we, we get from, from our patients in, in clinic. Um, and so we're at a similar place to a lot of other um, uh, patient populations in that we don't have a lot of evidence-based information on um, how to manage myasthenia gravis patients um, uh, in the current pandemic, what their risks are, what their, what their outcomes are if they get infected. Um, we, there was a, um, a consensus document um, that was published um, based on what we think are the best practices for managing patients currently. Um, and I think it's been a useful document so far, but it's really going to be important to, you know, uh, really study this thoroughly as best we can so that we have uh, better information to and, um, you know, scientifically based information to share with patients. And so one of the things that we have done um, in this regard is to start a registry that is now um, operating globally. And I have a, um, a slide on this. And it's called COVID-19 um, Associated uh, uh, Effects in Myasthenia Care MG. And so this is a, uh, a, a registry where uh, uh, investigators, uh, cl clinicians can report um, cases of, of patients that have um, had COVID-19 um, so that we can learn more about it. And so the, the cases that are submitted are um, anonymous, so there's no names or anything, anything like that that's, that's in there. Um, and to date, we've had um, over 60 cases that have been reported. You can see the breakdown just in terms of the you know, types of antibodies that patients have had. So not surprisingly, most of the patients that have had acetylcholine receptor antibody um, uh, form of myasthenia, some seronegative patients. And we've had, so far we're encouraged by the reporting that's been done so far. Um, we've had cases um, throughout, reported from North America, of course, but a lot from the United Kingdom uh, and some from other areas um, uh, of Europe uh, and Japan. And so we're really trying to get the word out to get as many people to participate in this as possible to report any cases that they have so that we can learn um, about this. Um, you know, so one of the, the things um, that's come out so far, um, which you can see here is, you know, in terms of the patients that have been rec reported to date, you know, is that there's been a, uh, you know, a pretty high mortality rate. This is a, a mortality rate that's much higher than the general population. Now, I, I do want to point out that we have to be extremely cautious um, interpreting these results um, because they're likely biased at this time. Um, and two of the main reasons of how they're biased is that this is a small number of patients. There are obviously thousands and thousands of uh, patients with myasthenia out there. Um, and this represents probably a small number 
of those that have had COVID-19. Um, so we need more cases to make sure that what we're capturing is representative of the overall population. In addition to that, these cases are more likely to uh, have been reported for patients that had really serious severe disease that were hospitalized or in the intensive care unit um, and, and uh, had lots of involvement from, um, from neuromuscular uh, specialists and so more likely to have been reported in that setting. So we, again, want to emphasize we need to be very cautious about this, but it also, you know, based on what we know right now, it, it also highlights, you know, how important it is to, to use the, the guidelines and to do the things that like the CDC suggests to re reduce your risk of um, getting infected with COVID-19. And I think you all know what those things what those, uh, what those things are in terms of social distancing, hand washing, wearing a mask, et cetera. Um, so uh, just please be very careful with that. You have another question, Sam? Let me know yes. if we need to, if we don't have time, but. We will need to, um, we will need to move on to the next presenters very soon, but um, I just wanna remind everybody that we will send out all the questions with the answers. Um, Susan asked, is MG a progressive disease? I have heard both yes and no. Yeah, so this is a, this is a good question. So, uh, so in the individual person, it's very hard to know whether uh, myasthenia gravis will progress or not. And this is a very common question we get in the clinic. You know, if I have, um, you know, ocular myasthenia, meaning um, just symptoms of double vision or drooping of my eyes, is it going to progress to other areas of my body? And in some and in some cases, it doesn't. Uh, and in others, it does. We don't have a great way to, on a routine basis, predict how that's going to happen. So th it, the general answer is it can be progressive, but not in all patients. Some patients, it stays the way it is. In other patients, it can also spontaneously get better, although it's very, very rare for it to, to go completely into remission on its own without, without treatment. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Mm -hmm. We do have additional questions, but I will just make sure that we get those answered and get them out to the sure. attendees for sure. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll, we'll definitely see you again at the seven o'clock town hall. Great, thank you, Sam. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our next group of presenters. I'm so excited that they're here tonight with us to talk with all of you guys. And I know that they're equally excited as well to be able to share some good information with our community members. Um, they're actually the four officers of our board. Um, we have Nancy Law. I know a lot of you know Nancy. She's the previous CEO and she's the current chair of our board. We have Brian Gladden, who is the vice chair of our board. Bill Sarwine, who is the treasurer of our board, and Denise Rossi, who is the secretary of our board. Um, they all give a tremendous amount of time and energy to MGFA, and I couldn't thank them enough for their, their guidance and leadership. Um, they're gonna talk to you a little bit about our new strategic plan, which we launched next fiscal year in January, uh, which we're working against right now to operationalize. Brian's gonna lead us off. He's gonna talk, to, give you a summary of the plan and they're each going to talk to you about, you know, what they're excited about with regards to the future for MGFA. So, Brian, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Great. Thanks, Sam. Great to be with everyone and uh, excited to share a bit of an overview of the work that we've done on the strategic plan over the last year. Um, Sam, can you pull up the, the charts? Yes. Just give well, me a second. I'll cover three or four things. One is a little bit about the process that we used and how we accomplished the strategic plan. So it's a little bit different than what we've done in the past. What we really learned from it uh, was some key learnings that we heard back as, as we talked to many of our stakeholders. And then I'll talk about some of the priorities that you can expect to see from us um, as we move forward and what the next steps are that help us execute on that strategy. So Sam, can you go to the next slide? So from a process standpoint, um, this really was, it started last summer. Uh, we, we put together a broad team, which included board members, included volunteers from outside of, of the board, 
Uh, and we also use some outside consultants, which was very uh, powerful for us. You know, we haven't historically been able to do that. And they, uh, they have uh, programs where they donate their time. And we were able to access some top consultants to support us in doing the strategic plan. It took about six months. Uh, and there was a big focus, which we, again, haven't necessarily done in the past, but listening to stakeholders and, and thinking about a longer term time horizon. So when we challenged ourselves to think about what's, uh, what's going to happen in the next 10 years and what do we need to do to be prepared and be ready and be ahead of changes that are going to occur. So uh, as you look at this chart, there were four pieces to the work. One was um, and it was all really outside in. So getting data from outside and not, not just sitting in a conference room and talking to ourselves, but, uh, but making sure we got new information from outside of MGFA. We surveyed uh, many of our stakeholders. We had 850 responses. I'm sure many of you had a chance to participate in that last September. Uh, we interviewed in detail about 58 people. And I know some of you were part of that process uh, where we spent 45 minutes to an hour really getting your perspective on MGFA and what we can do differently. Uh, we did a deep financial review and looked at uh, what, what we've done historically and where we stand financially. And then we had a chance to talk to CEOs from other foundations that were similar. So we talked to four other foundations and tried to learn from them what they do differently, what they might do better. Uh, and uh, there was a bit of a two-way dialogue where we had a chance to interact on that. So. That was the process and it really resulted in um, a summary that we shared with the board really in this in the January timeframe of, of this year. So Sam, can you go to the next one? Mm -hmm. uh, the 12 points that I would share with you of learnings that we took away and I'll go through this quickly and again you'll have access to these charts. Um, the first is that, you know, the feedback, we asked people what they thought about MGFA and what they would change. And, and the feedback, I would say, was overwhelmingly positive. We were probably surprised at how much positive energy there was and how positive the impact was that MGFA was having on people's lives. Um, there was really great, strong feedback on the progress that we've made over the last few years. And that was encouraging to say that we're working on the right things. Uh, our mission strategic activities were, were generally aligned with what people wanted from the, the foundation. Um, we've obviously made a lot of progress financially, and uh, you know that um, is a great testament to the support from many of our stakeholders and donors. Um, but you know we're still, we take on a lot of things, and we've spread ourselves thin and sometimes can't necessarily do them as well as we'd like to. So, uh, you know, there's an opportunity for us to continue to improve our financial standing. Um, fundraising is, is improved. Obviously, we've done a really good job over time of building up fundraising. But it's still, when you start to benchmark our fundraising versus other foundations in similar situations, we have an opportunity to increase and, and do, do a better job in fundraising. So that's something we'll spend time on. Um, Many of our stakeholders consistently, the one theme, if I took away anything from the work, was that they want us to spend more time on research and more of our resources and funding on research. So uh, we have, you saw the update from, from uh, Jeff earlier. Um, this is a big area of focus for us and something that as we are able to increase our fundraising and our financial status, so, you know, we, we will try and do even more to increase our focus on research. Um, there's a lot of activity. It's an exciting time for MG uh, patients and, and, and others who are involved around MG because there is so much energy uh, around uh, momentum and, and energy around research. Um, the population of, of stakeholders that deal with MGFA and talk to us are increasingly doing that via the web, doing that via social media, doing that via email and, and other uh, electronic means. Uh, and that's a trend. Now, that's, that being said, there are still many of our uh, key stakeholders who need to be uh, connected with us on paper and need to interact with us in more traditional ways. And that's why we have to protect some of those capabilities. Uh, we need to be able to reach remotely located patients better. Uh, we're better in larger cities where there's, uh, you know, great health care and, and strong health systems. Uh, and in some cities, there's a lot better care around MG than others. 
So we need to continue to invest to build tools that reach uh, patients who are remotely located. Uh, that, is, that also includes educating healthcare providers, uh, especially those that are, uh, you know, not necessarily experts or have not had experience with MG. You heard Jeff talk about MGNet. Uh, this is a huge game changer and the magnitude of investment from NIH in this, uh, this great program over the next few years is really uh, has a potential to be a game changer for us. So you'll see a lot more as uh, we are working closely with MGNet and, and very involved in that. It's, it's really important for us. Uh, technology is one that uh, we've made some progress. We've invested and in, I hope, hope everyone enjoys or is leveraging the new uh, website that we built and launched uh, about six months ago. Uh, I would tell you that uh, we've gotten very good feedback on that and that, that is good progress. I would also say that uh, one thing we're working on today is trying to upgrade and improve the MG, MyMG app, right? The, uh, on, you know, the, the tool that we use for mobile uh, connectivity. Uh, it's not very good and uh, it, it needs some updates and we're working on that right now. So you'll, you'll see coming in the future. And then the last thing is, as, uh, as we talk about MGFA, is really relooking at the staffing model, relooking at the board model, and how we, how we get business done. And um, recognizing that we're now more professional than we've been, and uh, that requires us to make some different investments and, and move the organization in a, in a bit of a different direction. So those are the summarized learnings that we had from the, the, the process that I described earlier. And uh, the next page lays out really the outcome and, and <laughs> we really believe we need to change around our vision, the, the mission and the strategies. What you'll see here is that our vision is the same. So a world without MG is the primary vision for our organization. We are, uh, our mission is similar. So creating communities, enhancing lives and curing MG was what we said in the past. And we added the, uh, the detail around improving the care. So we've added that to the mission statement. And then in the strategies, you'll see, uh, you know, we moved research to be the number one strategy and focusing on not only the underlying causes, but also treatment uh, techniques for MG. And you'll see the work that we're doing across research is touching both of those. Um, creating, uh, you know, tools that allow us to have online, but also in-person communities to support our, our, uh, our various stakeholders across uh, our groups better leveraging tools and technologies and, and part of that is allowing us to get to all of our stakeholders including those in remote locations and then uh, you know continuing i mean this is not a, a dramatic change here continuing to make sure that we're raising awareness through education advocacy strategic partnerships and spending more time on a, on a deeper communication strategy um, those are all things that uh, you know obviously were part of our strategies in the past but uh, you know, we will continue to increase focus there. So next page, Sam. This is, uh, these are the nine things that as a board, we spent time on this spring um, that we're gonna take action on. So number one is increasing and, and diversifying revenue sources. So improving our fundraising, and that will allow us to increase the impact that we can have with MGFA. Part of that will be uh, better development of strategic partnerships, uh, recognizing that there's a lot of energy and excitement from not only drug development companies, but other industry partners and, and our chance to leverage them and build deeper partnerships uh, is part of what we need to do. Um, provider education, and again, that's especially around uh, as the remote geographies, making sure we have tools and, you know, one of the exciting elements of telemedicine is it can help us touch uh, some of that patient community that's in the more remote locations. Uh, number four, making sure that we are leveraging fully this great opportunity with MGNet and that we're fully linked with them. Number five, um, increasing the priority of research. And, and that makes sure that, again, the work that, that Jeff talked about, and, and that will continue to uh, not only focus on a cure, but also on treatment and therapies. Uh, upgrading our technology, and that's, you know, how we do business internally and as a foundation, but also, again, the website, making sure that that's a contemporary and useful tool, but also the, the mobile app, uh, robust marketing and communications, and making sure that we can apply that across everything that we do and, and communicate clearly and effectively. 
Um, there is, you know, as you know, a lot of energy globally around MG, and there are many other organizations similar to ours, and trying to make sure that we're in a position to integrate and play a role with those other organizations and leverage the global power of what we're doing here. Um, that's a longer term initiative for us, but one that as a board, we think uh, we're positioned to help, you know, on a global basis and maybe pool some of those resources to be more effective. And then lastly, you know, and, and something that you've seen us already take some some early actions on it really uh, is, is addressing some of the staffing and organization and board models. And we, we continue to work on that, making sure that we're as efficient as we can be, we're as effective as we can be, and we're, we're as linked to our communities, whether that's patient community, the volunteer community, uh, and all of that is working well. And, and again, there's a lot of change going on there and we're working our way through that, but we think we're moving in the right direction and we're gonna be more successful for that. So those are nine priorities that you'll hear us talk more about as we move forward. And then this last chart is really about how we operationalize this strategic plan. And, you know, Sam and the staff are now in a position to take this strategy uh, document and turn it into a real operational plan and put resources up against uh, executing on this. You know, this framework that we see here around driving impact, um, ensuring that we're driving growth, especially around our different sources of revenue, and then, uh, you know, using the movement as we mobilize to support this mission. You know, those are three. That's a framework that allows us to, to really drive this forward. And uh, that's, that's something that, again, we'll talk to you more about as we move forward. But I uh, wanted to share with you the broader framework. And now I think you'll get a chance to hear from uh, some of the other uh, board members and officers about, uh, you know, the, some more details around the strategy. So I look forward to um, seeing this plan come to life. And, uh, and keeping you updated as we move forward. And with that, I'll hand it off to our chair, uh, Nancy Law. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, it is exciting to see uh, everything that's happening at MGFA. Um, I, I will say, you know, when you talked about technology, Brian, um, and we, if you could go ahead and go on to the next, next slide, Sam, that would be great. So, you know, when you talked about, about technology, I, I had to laugh and say, we really all just got a crash course. You know, we had intentionally thought there are many ways that we can, can use today's modern technology to reach out and better serve our MG community. And we had to learn in a hurry. Um, you know, our, our, the pandemic has certainly changed the way we work but it hasn't changed our goals and it hasn't changed our sense of urgency. And, you know, we are, I want MG to continue to be the premier source of MG um, information for patients and families, not just in the United States, but in the world. So, you know, our goal of, again, our goal of leveraging, leveraging technology has had to happen in a hurry. Um, I think many of you participated in our national conference that was held virtually this year, um, that uh, a month on the dates where we had um, intended to, to go forward, and a month after we had to pull the plug and realize that because of the pandemic, we weren't going to be able to bring people together. But what, what we saw was a five-fold increase in expected attendance that, and, and from 42 countries. So I think this was the beginning, Brian, of us beginning to be um, a, more of a global organization and to see the power and the reach that we have. So we're, we're continuing to work. We've got a couple of interesting projects happening, um, you know, in, in um, um, conjunction with a couple of our industry partners where we're really meeting for the first time with other MG, MG organizations from around the globe. And it's been really exciting to see. And also to see um, where we can, we can be leaders. So certainly we continue to build on that website. You know, our social media has, uh, social media has become probably more important for all of us who live with myasthenia gravis during this time as we've um, been sheltering at home, as Jeff says, our, you know, I hear so much from our population that they're, you know, you're really, you're really sticking to the rules. You're wearing your masks, you're social distancing. And, and many of you, you know, really still very hesitant to go out. So 
you know, we've used our Facebook page as a way to communicate. Um, our volunteer, Celia Meyer, another board member, has made sure that what we post goes to other places as well, so that we're really meeting people where we where they are um, through social media. Um, our support group leaders, bless them all, they're amazing. They have learned Zoom, and some of them are real pros. And so we have been seeing um, some, some just very exciting, very exciting things happening with people attending support groups who had once again, never been able to go before. So this is really, it's, it's changed the way we work and it's changed as it, not, you know, once, once COVID has passed us, certainly we look forward to getting back together, but we now know that we can really make an, an imprint with virtual conferences. We have heard enthusiasm from the medical and scientific community about us taking our scientific session to a virtual platform and, and to really build connections through the world. So I want to um, go on to the next slide and, and pass the gavel over to um, my colleague, Denise Rossi, who's the secretary for our board of directors. Denise is um, a, a social worker, a medical social worker. So I asked her if she'd address some of these life management strategies and the kinds of things we're working on. Um, and you'll hear more too from um, our staff a little bit later about our wellness series. So we won't go into detail on that here, but certainly these are important strategies. So Denise. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. Um, yeah, so um, as a social worker, yes, my passion is um, managing a life management strategies. Um, and, you know, I am very excited about um, the capabilities we have uh, with the new organization, how we continue to um, strengthen our ability to reach out and support the community. Um, so, yes, the wellness series has been very well received. I think we're going to have some more detailed conversation about it. But um, if you have not um, already been um, paying attention to or been participating, um, the next one is this Friday. Um, and all of the um, previous webinars have been um, uploaded to the website, so you can go out and um, access them there. In terms of, you know, managing the day-to-day -day life, um, met symptom management is important. I think it's a critical issue to everyone. Um, and in addition to our funding, the um, consensus guidelines, we provide through the website um, additional information on how you can manage the, um, all your symptoms. We continue to have our helpline um, if the number has not changed, um, and there's an ability to reach out to us um, via email at MGFA. Um, and we really pride ourselves on being able to respond quickly to um, each of your outreach. Um, I think we continue to expand, and this is an area where I think um, putting my social work hat on, you know, we, there are areas that we can probably expand and bring greater expertise in, in terms of how to provide you information, not only on dealing with the illness, but um, getting community resources and dealing with the government, because we know how challenging that can be to get the support that people need from various times. Um, MG Friends is a peer support um, program. And so this allows people who want that one-on-one -on -one connection, that, that phone call, the ability to talk to someone who's been there, who's lived through it, um, and make that connection. So that we continue to engage and train people and expand and so that we have the ability to connect everyone who needs someone um, with someone that matches them either the type of MG they have or, you know, their age group or what they're going through. Um, and that's particularly helpful for the people that are newly diagnosed. Um, so I think that, you know, these are areas that we've always tried to do um, the best for the community in, and I am very excited about our ability to continue to, to grow and provide um, additional support in this area. And so Nancy, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thanks. And, um, you know, uh, Brian, Brian talked a little bit about the survey 
that we conducted as well as the interviews. And in addition to the importance of research, research about understanding MG better, and also research into treatments, the other thing that came across loud and clear was the need for optimal health care. And what we heard as, as, a, as something that needed extra work was our ability to, um, to be able to go to an emergency room or to just our own um, personal care doctors, um, to other specialists and have people not say, how do you spell that? So, you know, we, we really have a lot of work to do um, in helping other healthcare professionals other than our own MG specialists. You know, we, our, our fellowship program and all those, those other things we're doing really help to develop those specialists, the people who have an interest in MG. But, but we've got other work to do for us to have better care um, in our own communities. So we're focusing on, um, on, pers on, on um, people's primary care providers, um, emergency room personnel. Certainly we heard a lot about people's um, experiences at ERs and, and not always um, having the personnel there understand MG. Um, we talked about rural neurologists too, who may see, you know, every, every disease and every condition, but, you know, more migraines or they may see seizures, but, you know, maybe one or two um, or a handful of people at the most um, who have the rare condition, myasthenia gravis. Um, and we, and, and so, and even general neurology practices, you know, there can be, you know, a practice in a fairly good sized city like Virginia Beach or Allentown or, um, or, or, you know, um, Parker, Colorado, where there might be, there might indeed be neuro neurological practices, but nobody there who really focuses on MG. And then finally, again, on eye doctors who may be the very first ones to see that symptom, that droopy eyelid or that double vision um, that could catch MG early and, and lead to an earlier diagnosis. So, you know, we're, we're talking about leveraging the experts, experts that we have have, um, like Dr. Guptill, who spoke early, and, and his many colleagues who are amazing in the time that they give at volunteering for us, for our community. And they're very willing to, to reach out. So um, we had, right before COVID started, we had one of our first um, MG educational luncheons that was um, sponsored by us. And um, Dr. Yubing Lee from Cleveland Clinic went to Allentown and spoke to her neurological practice there about myasthenia gravis. And so we were just beginning to get some of these set up when, when things changed, but we haven't given up on that. And we're certainly also seeing the use of today's technology um, to connect others in rare disease, experts with people out in the community who may be treating one or two people with, with a certain disease, a certain condition, but need more familiarity. And that's, that's called a hub and spoke strategy. So, so we're looking at different ways that we might be able to connect with those clinicians and improve care. And you'll be hearing more about that um, over the next year or two as we really begin to, to look at how we can implement those strategies. So I think that's, that's it for me on that. And I'd like to turn things over to our treasurer, very important guy, the guy who makes sure that we're spending money in the right way and um, being good stewards of our donations, Bill Sauerwein. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks very much. And uh, hello everyone. I'm uh, delighted to be able to participate in the uh, MG Town Hall today. Because we have a full agenda, I will try to keep my remarks brief because of the time constraints. You'll have to excuse my voice. I'm suffering from uh, uh, some sinus problems. Uh, the future of MGFA has never been brighter than it is today. Thanks in part to our CEO, Sam, and the very talented professional staff that she has been able to assemble. Also contributing to our success is the input from our dedicated board of directors, both past and present, our volunteers and loyal sponsors. Without their collective efforts, continued success would not be possible. The unprecedented uh, uh, pandemic that we are all experience, experiencing has taken a toll on all members 
of the MG community, including the activities of the MGFA. While most of the country was approaching lockdown, the staff at MGFA was able to create a virtual nas national and international conference that allowed for a wide range of participation. This conference was a huge success and the feedback was extremely positive. The number of attendees for this conference increased dramatically over prior years. Today, the use of virtual communications has become an integral part of MGFA. I'm pleased to report that while the financial markets have been on a roller coaster ride over the last several months, MGFA continues to be very sound and on a solid financial footing. At the beginning of the COVID-19 explosion, a decision was made to take a very conservative position with regard to our investment portfolio. This turned out to be the right approach. We are currently in a position that will allow us to fund our existing research grants, as well as provide funding for future grant requests and continue to fund new innovative future programs. While we continue to explore new sources of revenue, we are very appreciative of the generous financial contributions from the MG community and our loyal sponsors. We are working diligently in an effort to try to come up with some new fundraising ideas that will increase our ability to make more investments and continue to uh, improve our revenue stream. I'm very, very excited to be back on the board. I served on the board for four years prior to being reelected this past April. And I could say the energy on the board right now is unprecedented. I've never seen such energy as being displayed by our leadership and I'm very, very pleased to be a part of it and looking forward to uh, making many contributions in the uh, months ahead. I'm also delighted to be able to work with Brian Gladden who is uh, an expert when it comes to uh, finances and Brian and I have been consulting on uh, our investment portfolio and we'll continue to monitor this as we go forward. But the excitement within MGFA right now is unparalleled and uh, I'm extremely excited to be part of it. In closing, I would like to say we're all united for one goal, a world without MG. I think Sam, you have a couple of uh, slides. Yeah, I have them up. I'm just gonna go to the second slide right now. There you go. Okay, the financial health and national trends. Uh, on the left is the national giving trends. Uh, some of this information was derived from the uh, Wall Street uh, Journal article that was just re recently released. Uh, as you can see, the uh, individual giving has declined 6% on the first quarter of this year compared to, compared to last year. And the nonprofit sector potentially can experience a revenue loss of about $25 billion in 2020. 13 billion of this has been directed towards the coronavirus effort, large institutions like the American Cancer Society, March of Dimes, um, and some of the other uh, nonprofits are experiencing about a 50% uh, drop in fundraising. Now, conversely, if you look at the MGFA slide to the right, we are exceeding our budget for 2020, which is remarkable. This ability to recover the financial losses includes gifts from planned giving, increase in third party events, and new revenue streams identified by the staff. The staff have pivoted to virtual programming events, which is enabling us to take advantage of some other opportunities, engage with donors on a broad, broad, broader reach. <clears throat> The walks are projected to be down 25% in comparison to the national average of a 46% decrease. I think this is remarkable in itself. And that's partially due to our, our virtual programs that have been adopted by staff. Facebook fundraising projected to exceed budget by 25%. That is also a remarkable number, and uh, I think that's going to help us tremendously going forward. And due to the uh, strategic initiatives, MGFA has been able to bring professional staff in-house and better position the organi organization for growth. 
our new professional staff is a big key to the continuing success of MGFA. And I commend Sam for putting this group together. To summarize, MGFA is successfully navigating through this unfortunate pandemic. This is truly good news and an otherwise bad news environment. We at MGFA are encouraged that we will continue to enjoy favorable success going forward. Thanks to the unwavering support of our MG family and the continued support of our loyal sponsors. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I really want to thank um, Nancy, Brian, Bill, and Denise for joining us today. And they're going to join us for the next town hall at 7 o'clock this evening. Um, I really thought that it would be great for our community members to hear our, our top board leadership talk to you about this new strategic plan we're about to embark on and just talk to you a little bit about what they're excited about. There's a lot of moving pieces and the future is certainly bright for MGFA. Um, and it's, it's, it's our future, it's our organization. So um, I hope you're all as excited about it as well. So thank you to the four board officers for joining us. We're gonna move on now. I do wanna be cognizant of time. I can tell you right now that the last two updates we have are pretty quick. Um, there'll be two updates given by the staff um, around programming and fundraising, and um, then we'll wrap it up. We, we do have a record of all of the questions and we will make sure that every single question gets gets answered and out to you and follow up with all of the slides and all the materials. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over now to Jenna Mavala. Um, Jenna is our new Director of Patient Advocacy and Community Engagement. And she's gonna talk to you about our latest program that we just started about five weeks ago, our wellness series. And Jenna, I'm just gonna pull your slides up real quickly. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. Here you go. Thanks. Hi everyone. I'm happy to talk to you guys today about the wellness series. Real quick, I'm just gonna cover why the wellness series, why now? What topics have we presented on so far? What ones will we be covering? And how can you access that information so that you can join us for upcoming wellness webinars and also so that you can find past presentations. So the wellness series was created um, in response to COVID and the unique set of challenges that it has created for the MG community. It's a series of webinars designed to educate, empower, and connect MG patients, care partners, and medical professionals. You can go to the next slide. So we've had four presentations so far, and we've covered a range of topics. We had staying calm when the world is not, MG and OT, IVIG standards of care during COVID, and exercise, exercising and staying active at home. All of these webinars are available on our website, and in a couple slides, I'm gonna show you where you can get that information. What's unique about the series is that we have a guest speaker come for every presentation. These, these speakers are experts and really well-versed in the topics that they're presenting on. They give a 20-minute presentation, and following that, there's time for Q&A. This allows the participants on the call to have the opportunity to ask questions directly to the speaker. And it's been very engaging so far. So you can go to the next slide, thanks. If you haven't had a chance to join us for a call, I wanna invite you to do so. And if you have already, I thank you and I wanna show you the upcoming webinars that we have. This Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we're gonna be presenting on how do you prepare for a telemedicine call, which is something that's very relevant right now for a lot of the MG community. Um, next slide, please. So where, where can you register to attend? How can you find this information? It's all listed on the MGFA website. We have created a separate landing page for the series. If you don't wanna, type all of the information that's included on that um, web address there. You can just go to the MGFA webpage. If you look on the home screen, the, this picture will show up on the revolving banner bar there. If you click on the link, it'll bring you right to the page. The first thing you can do is register for whatever webinar is coming up. After you've done that, you can scroll down and you can see all of the videos for webinars that we've already posted. So 
maybe you didn't get to attend the webinar, but you want to see it, you can get it there. Also, if you've seen the webinar, but want to look at the slides again, maybe look at some of the exercises Charlene went through, you can also go there and find it. This information is being sent out weekly via email. If you're on our email list and not getting the invites, I suggest you check your spam box. If you're not on our email list and want to get the invites, join our email. Um, I will say if you sign up for these webinars to be, to be a part of the email list, you will get all of the MGFA emails as well. We're also posting updates on Facebook and social media. So if you're active there, you can find that information as well. I wanted to say thank you to our presenting sponsors as well as our supporting sponsors for the series. And then I also wanted to thank everyone in the community who's been able to attend for your participation. Once again, if you haven't been able to attend, I invite you to join us. We have them running from now through the end of September. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. We appreciate that. It's a great update. And if you haven't attended the wellness series, we are receiving such, such positive feedback around. I really encourage you to check them out on Friday. Okay, so now we're going to hand it over to Craig Strainer, who's our VP of Development, and um, Sam Gardner, who's our Director of Fundraising, and they're going to talk to you about, we're, about our event called Together We Stand, and I don't want to steal any thunder. We're currently in our fundraising season right now, so it's really exciting, and I hope they get you guys pumped up about this very special, meaningful event. So Craig, I'm going to get the slides up. Okay, thanks, Sam, and thank everybody for staying on the line for a little bit of extra time. Uh, can't tell you how enthused I am to be part of an organization that can pivot so quickly to put together a virtual culmination of a fundraising season. We don't want to call it necessarily a fundraising event. Our fundraising season is still now. We have just changed the optics from true walks to creativity to provide a platform to highlight all that MGFA has to offer. And Sam, if you go to, to the next screen, a perfect example uh, of, of this pivot, and I think Jessica is on the call. Uh, Jessica has started something called the Duck Derby, which is allowing a very, very low entry point for potential new donors to come into the MGFA family. So we're very excited that we have this capability with this virtual event on a national platform. Uh, but the event itself is called MGFA Together We Stand, and it's basically highlighting all that MGFA has to offer to our communities. There'll be taped interviews, there'll be highlights, there'll be fun and games, there'll be uh, contests. So we're trying to make it available to anybody that has any interest in any part of the association. And what I'd like uh, Sam Gardner to do is just touch on a couple of ways that, that people can get involved prior to the event so that we can show how much money we've raised at the event. If you think telethonic, if that's even a word anymore, think about the, the old school telethons when Jerry Lewis would bang the drums and uh, Ed McMahon would give the old, uh, you know, how much we've raised. We want to be able to do that and, and shout and scream from the rooftops. So uh, Sam, if you just want to touch on briefly a couple of things so we don't take up too much time and um, leave time for questions. Sure. Thanks, Craig. Uh, well, first, I want to say that we um, received a $10,000 matching gift from um, Premium Milan and Landscape that we're using through the month of August for the first $10,000 that comes into the MGFA for this event. So we're really excited about that. Ways that you can get involved and help to fundraise for this event. Um, one would be hosting a birthday fundraiser on Facebook. It's a really easy way to um, fundraise and pe people are doing it all over the country right now. So get involved that way. You could also start a virtual walk team just like you have in the past, but this year it'll be virtual. You can host a Zoom fundraiser. Um, to Craig mentioned the duck derby. You can join that duck derby, either um, purchase some ducks or join a team. Um, or you could create your own personal DIY fundraiser. So there's a lot of different ways to get involved. And most importantly, we really want you guys to spread the word for us and tell others about this event and talk to them also about how they can help support the MGFA through this virtual fundraiser so, or for virtual event. So we hope to see you all there. Great, thank you. Well, I, 
said that the last two updates were quick and we did, we tried to wrap it up for you guys. I really, I, I, because I've been running the slides, I haven't been able to really look at the questions too much, but I promise you that we will record all the questions and get the answers out to all of you. And just really on behalf of our, our staff and our board, I wanna thank you all again for joining us today for our town hall and um, we'll be hosting them every few months. So we'll get the next day out very soon. Um, I hope that you learned a lot. Again, I hope that you saw yourselves in all of these updates and um, we just really appreciate you so much. So thank you for joining us and have a great evening.